going on there, everybody? This is Samuel Fisher from Green Dispensary Marketing. Great to be back with you again with another guest. This is Kevin Taylor. He is the founder of Populous, um, and he's got lots of information on us um, regarding corporate bias, hiring, um, best practices for hiring in the cannabis industry. Really excited to talk with Kevin. He's got lots of great information for us today. How are you doing today, Kevin? I'm doing great, Sam. Thanks for uh, thanks for interviewing me. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, real quick, I want to start off uh, just getting to know you a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit more about you, uh, what you do, your background, uh, your elevator pitch? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've been doing training and management consulting of one stripe or another uh, uh, since about 2009, so a bit over a bit over a decade now. And I have a very esoteric kind of specialization. It's called instructional systems design. It sounds really fancy, but the easiest way to explain it is, you know, I apply design thinking, you know, start with the end in mind, kind of work your way backwards with the KPIs of an organization. And then I can help them design uh, portfolios of training solutions, not just, you know, one-off solutions, but an entire system of things that work together. Um, and it's it, it's easier than you would think if you have the right tools and the right education. Unfortunately, I, I have both. Um, but it's been interesting to try and sell this concept into the cannabis space. And uh, when I returned back to self-employment after helping build a cannabis startup um, for the first three years, I was looking around for um, an easy sell. And a colleague of mine had me participate in a kind of a draft trial workshop she was running when she first got certified in the Everything Disk System by Wiley and Sons Publishing. And uh, when I was kind of looking for that next pivot, I called her up, talked with her about it. She got me connected with uh, that organization. I got certified and, you know, I've been you know, pitching those services ever since. Awesome. Well, let's talk about these services. So the name of the company is Populous that you operate under, correct? And so yeah, yeah. more about these uh, easy sales that you came up with, man. Tell me about it. <laughs> well, I, I, I wish it were a super easy sell. I, I think it should be an easy sell. But the uh, the thing about Populous, Populous is Latin for people, you know, although trying to change things up a little bit and put a Z at the end of it. So um, the one thing that I've learned over man doing management consulting for the last 10 years is that people are people no matter where you go. Um, you, I see the same challenges, I see the same uh, problems, I see the same patterns emerging over and over and over again. Well, why is that? Well, if there's some sort of fundamental commonality between people, there's got to be an explanation for it. Uh, I've got two degrees, both of them, uh, one of them is officially a psychology degree, um, behavioral science and statistics. And then the next one is more of an applied industrial organizational specialization called um, uh, instruction or workplace, uh, oh, they changed the name of the program, organizational performance and workplace learning. So taking a look at a business system and all the human touch points with a specific eye on what does training need to look like in order for people to execute day to day. And <clears throat> one of the things that we, we really very rarely talk about, although it's starting to become more of a topic, is mental health in the workplace and mental health is so much more multifaceted than people tend to make it out to be, right? Like it's kind of like with HR. HR is a very multifaceted discipline, same with marketing, same with finance. But when we hear about corporate leaders talking about, oh, we need to bring in somebody to do the HR. We need to bring somebody in to do the marketing. For anybody who works in those fields, you're like, okay, that's a bit of a loaded statement, isn't it? So when we talk about mental health in the workplace, it's no different. And one of the areas that we really don't talk a lot about are the uh, kind of ins and outs of how the human mind works. And what's really interesting about personality theory and about the DISC theory in particular is that it is very accurate. It, it's very actionable. And it helps us understand ourselves as individuals while also stepping into the shoes of another person. Because anybody who's taken a Myers-Briggs type indicator or strengths finder or some other kind of assessment, the report you get clearly puts people into boxes and it helps us identify specific patterns in the way they think and the way that they behave that 
yield insights in how we can approach that person, how we can leverage their strengths, how we can identify the ways in which they get in their own way and adapt to that and to work with that. And this is something that is such a vital part of people skills. And when you look at the uh, need for people skills and soft skills in a lot of organizations, most organizations say, yeah, these are super duper important, but they have zero training, zero resources uh, to implement that. And just speaking from personal experience, I don't know if anybody else has had this, but a very few college programs actually teach you anything applicable about psychology. You get a lot of theory and a lot of basic facts, but nothing that's actually actionable and can help you improve your life. Uh, and that's what I like about the Everything Disc system is that it is very much so grounded in theory, backed by decades of research and can yield a lot of really valuable insights and has always been from day one of its inception, a tool for helping people in the workplace relate to one another. Yeah, yeah we're definitely going to jump into the, the disc assessments. I, I'm not actually kind of over my head, to be honest with you, but I do want to jump into it. A little bit <laughs> it's more super easy. Um, and then one, one thing, uh, we were talking over DMs recently over LinkedIn, sent a voice notes, and then uh, you, you gave me a lot of uh, good information and up to the point where it's like, oh, yeah, let's get on the show, man. Let's just talk about it here. Let's record it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the topics that I found kind of interesting is this uh, topic of corporate snobbery in the cannabis industry. Can you tell me a little bit more what you mean by that? Um, some real life examples that you've encountered? Well, I, I, I fortunately have not personally experienced that, but I know people that have, and you also see headlines. Um, one of the things that is pretty common right now is the unionization push that we see across the industry. Um, and honestly, I, I feel like I feel like the unionization efforts have some some fair points to make, um, especially when it comes to the kind of commitment that these organizations show towards social equity. Um, but for me, corporate snobbery, I would define it as seeing somebody as other than yourself based largely off of their access to education and how they came into their particular position. And within cannabis, we have this very interesting dynamic emerging where you have a lot of very passionate people coming back from the marginalized edges of counterculture where they have lived and been treated as criminals for the vast majority of their lives. Yeah. But now they're in positions that might have the title of like senior compliance director. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Six months ago, this guy was, you know, running an underground grow. Now he's head of cultivation for a startup in Michigan. So like that's a very rapid shift. And, you know, having spent a significant portion of my youth, you know, with one foot in counterculture and one foot in the professional world, you know, there, there's not a lot of skills development that, that happens in, in the counterculture world. Now, on the flip side of that, you have the white collar folks coming in from other corporate organizations where they're trying to make their mark. They're, they're enthusiastic about cannabis. They've, they've got reasons for coming into the industry. But then they also bring with them a lot of the biases that have come with working in those environments. And one of them is this notion of the value of higher education. I feel like that the, the, the millennial generation, we have a slightly different attitude towards higher ed. Like we've been promised that it was the gateway to prosperity. And for many of us, it, it hasn't always been. Um, but nevertheless, I feel like that perception and that attitude still persists inside of cannabis. And I can give you a good example and a good dynamic. Yeah, go for it. Um, question. Follow up. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you might have... Um, it, Let's say you have a very specific personality type. And what we know from personality theory is that specific attitudes, perspectives, behaviors, trigger issues, a lot of these things are accurately predicted and consistently predicted by your personality style. One trait that tends to be predicted by a particular style is this notion that the rules are made, are meant to be bent. Um, this is a very consistent mentality that I think you see with a lot of folks in the cannabis sector. Um, but depending on who is demonstrating that and the optics around that person, it's going to be interpreted very differently. So let's say you have a, um, a marketing professional, several years of doing marketing for maybe a large beverage distributor. Um, they're coming into cannabis and they 
have this tendency to feel like the rules don't apply to them. Well, if they happen to be very kind of go-getter and, and self-starter, that behavior might be interpreted as a positive um, because this individual is willing to push the envelope. We know how difficult it is to do things in cannabis marketing. So somebody who's willing to take a little bit of risk and, you know, kind of change the rules as it were is something that's going to resonate with a lot of the leadership. I feel like we find in cannabis because quite frankly, like a lot of the leadership have this, this tendency. Um, now, Let's say that we have a uh, social media marketing individual who kind of came up through the ranks, what United Airlines would now call an alternative pathway to career growth. Uh, they've been doing some very interesting work in that field. It's worth it, like, taking a look at. And the same individual has a propensity to bend the rules or feel like they don't apply to them. Well, because they came up through the ranks and they don't have a college education, and some of the things that they have proposed are a little on the risky side, but really no more risky than this other individual, they might be perceived as being less professional, more high risk, right? It's the lack of that college experience that we think adds so much to an individual. But quite frankly, I've worked for some, some grads from the Ivy League, and quite frankly, I'm not all that impressed. So like how much professionalism and how much grit and how much perspective does higher ed actually give to you? Especially when these two tendencies are equal, equally probable in both personalities, but really what's, what's changed is the way that, in which other people perceive them. So that is an example of corporate snobbery. It is the willingness to interpret another person's behavior as less than ideal when that same behavior from a similar individual is seen as an edge. That is bias. That is going to fundamentally undermine the harmony of that team over time. And you're, you could potentially lose a very valuable social media marketing person as a result of that. Yeah. I think uh, if I'm understanding correctly here, the part of the reason that this may occur is that they kind of just see an applicant, they get along with them over text, over talking to them real, real briefly, and they see that they have the same passion for cannabis that they do. Is that, all right, you're hired. Is that, is that what you're kind of referring to as well? To touch upon the same topic here. Yeah, exactly. Right. We see a lot of folks being hired in because of their passion for the plant, but not necessarily because of the expertise that they bring in. And so under those circumstances, those folks are just as likely to be evaluated negatively because of the justification that was given for hiring them. Even if so, so you know, it, it, it becomes a comparison <laughs> Um, so, so, so we want to hire a cannabis enthusiast. You know, if you're a dispensary owner, you want to hire a cannabis enthusiast. Sorry for talking over you. Um, how do, how do we balance um, corporate snobbery with the need for these cannabis enthusiasts and still have the talent that we need, the expertise that we need? What would, what would you say? Number one, I think it is important to identify a good job description and make sure that that job actually aligns with what needs to happen on the job. And that's not a that's a challenge for every industry. The number of people out in the professional world that have applied for a job and the one they ended up doing matched did not match the job description they applied for. That's that's very common, unfortunately. So that's step number one. Yeah. Step number two is having a firm understanding of what it is this person is expected to produce. A lot of times team leads and team managers have a vague notion of the value that this individual needs to produce but they don't have a clear picture in their head of exactly how they're going to do it. They kind of expect this individual to figure it out. Okay, well, if you expect the individual to figure it out, you need to be hiring for somebody that has that kind of experience on their resume. Passion for the plant is not going to substitute for having experience running a multi-channel marketing campaign. Absolutely. It just, it just won't. It might give you a better sense of the kind of content that will resonate in those channels, but it's not going to help you understand how to structure the campaign, how to use the tools, how to automate some of the work. Those are things that come with experience. So you need to be able to balance those two things. Um, and unfortunately, right now, it's, it's tough for the cannabis sector because the other thing that you have to be willing to do to attract the right people is pay in, like market going rates. And there's a lot of cannabis companies that really do have this attitude of, oh, well, if you want to work in the industry, you have to be willing to make a sweat equity investment. You have to be willing to take a pay cut. You have to be willing to make these sacrifices. But they don't really offer much in the way of compensation for that. Yeah. And in many cases. A lot of LinkedIn people complain about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. 
And it's it's sad because ultimately the, it creates a reputation in the industry. And, you know, that anybody who's out there who thinks that somehow they're going to magically make their mark and they buy into the sweat equity argument, I've got to stop you. And I want you to ask this one question. How much of a stake do you have in the organization unless you own part of it? If you don't have an ownership stake, you are labor. It doesn't matter how white or starched your collar is. Yeah. Love it. So let's jump, kind of jump into this a little bit. So how do you think companies in the cannabis industry can create this inclusive hiring process that values diverse backgrounds, underrepresented people, all sorts of different experiences? What, what's, what's the Kevin Taylor solution? What's the popular solution? Well, so Kevin will point at HR experts who are good at recruitment and say, fine tune your process based on current best practice for trying to source talent that may not have a, um, a college education. Yet Canvas has this really bad attitude, like a lot of uh, or like a lot of industries that not invented here, and they think that they came up with stuff. Like, not be interdisciplinary. Reach out to people outside of the bubble. Be a representative and ambassador for your industry, and you know, don't don't let other people's stigma stop you from being a professional. That's that's step number one in advice to people building that up. The other thing that populists can have an opinion on is being aware of what I call style bias. Style bias is when organizations have a product, one, they're, they're ignorant of the impact that personality has on every aspect of their organization. And the number of people and the number of personalities you have operating needs to be managed and understood through a sensible framework. If you don't have that framework, it's all too easy to assume that only one type of leadership actually adds value. And this is very common in American in the American business world. We assume that leaders have to be direct and bold and um, you know very commanding. They've got to be influencers and politicians. And there are certain other kinds of leadership behaviors that are valued, but they often coincide with personality traits that say to those folks in those other leadership positions, the more influential or the more dominant ones, that these folks may not have what it takes to be leaders. And that's wrong. That is just flat out wrong. There's zero research to indicate that. And when you ask them, that's based on their personal opinion and a gut feeling at, at most, right? Maybe some personal experience, but what happens is when the style bias is allowed to foster within an organization, you end up with a kind of tunnel vision or a very narrow sense of what kinds of skills are going to be valuable in a certain kind of position. And you start introducing the kind of bias in favor of hiring more styles that lack these other leadership behaviors. So you create this really horribly imbalanced set of personalities in positions of power and authority. And there's problems that go along with that when you look at the research about the ways in which these kind of, uh, higher leadership personalities tend to get in their own way. Interesting. So I think um, another kind of topic that I wanted to jump into that is also similar to what we're kind of already touching upon here is the on-personality assessments, so specifically the DISC. Um, and so I'm assuming this is another strategy that we can kind of uh, hire some more people uh, with, from different diverse backgrounds, diverse personality types, correct? Yes, it's interesting because Caraleaf is actually adopting another a DISC product that is different than what I um, practice. They, the platform that they're using is called Take Flight. Um, I'm certified in everything DISC. DISC is open source at this point. It's, you know, it was introduced as a theory over a century ago by uh, you know, largely in, in an academic context. So, so can you explain what DISC is for the, the dumb people like myself who don't know anything about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So DISC is an acronym. It stands for the four primary personality types that are identified by the DISC theory. There's four primary ones and then eight blended ones, which are you know, a mix of two, two or more styles. Um, D stands for dominant. If I can use the example of a mountaineering team, these are the fearless leaders that are out in front and charting the course, and they can be very directive and seek to exert a lot of control over their environments. You have the influencers, who that's the I in DISC, who are the cheerleaders. They are people that see the new opportunities, get folks excited, and, and project enthusiasm. They add a lot of liveliness to the world of work. It's much needed. And they're also the social butterflies that are great at going out and networking. So you tend to see a lot of folks with I styles working in sales positions. Um, the S stands for steadiness. These are the folks that value harmony within a group. 
stable work environments where the, the daily routine happens day to day. These are fantastic folks if you need an organization that runs like clockwork and is very stable and folks are getting along and otherwise, you know, you're, you're not seeing a lot of disharmony. And then you have folks with the conscientious style. That's the style that I have. We tend to be more analysts. Uh, we are very fact-driven, very highly driven towards accuracy. Uh, the idea of making a mistake for us is absolutely atrocious. So we do our homework and we make sure that when we say something, that we are right and that we can back it up. And it's not an arrogance thing. It's, you know, an acknowledgement that when when we're wrong like that, it can have real costs and, and you know, even create harm if we say the wrong thing or we you know, present the wrong set of facts. So that's why you see the due diligence there. Now, all of these different styles, the DISC, um, the DISC uh, model, have different strengths and different, um, shall we say, weaknesses. Although I really don't like phrasing it like that because these aren't inherently you know, blockers to personal growth. They're just the areas that folks need to focus on. For personal growth. And that's one of the great things about DISC is that we know that these different personality styles have highly predictable growth areas that are easy to identify with these assessments. This might sound like we're pigeonholing people, but it really isn't. We're all definitely unique individuals. And that's the first lesson of DISC is that we're all a unique mix of these different um, personality traits. But one is always going to be more dominant than the other. And we are unique, but unique in predictable ways. And it's those predictable ways that create this uh, more of a tech, that introduces more of a te as a technology, something that we can apply to making our lives better. It's not just some you know weird academic theory that you know some consultant is, is espousing. What are some uh, specific strategies that managers, uh, whether it be the HR manager, the boss, whatever? Um, have to kind of balance the employees' workloads and styles or workloads and tasks based on these disk personality styles? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, it, it's different for each person, right? So let's say that you're managing a team and you have, you know, eight people, you got two dominance, two influencers, two steady styles, and two conscientiousness styles. Each of those different styles are going to have different ways that you want to engage them for things like feedback, communication, delegation. They have different psychological safety needs. So um, oh, hold on just one second. Um, anyway, as I was saying, each of these different styles has a broad range of ways that they can be approached. So, for example, with your dominant styles, if you're going to delegate something to them, give them a very clear objective, give them a couple of basic key things that they need to hit with it, but otherwise be as hands-off as you can. Those folks really might very much so value autonomy. Uh, they don't like being micromanaged. They, they have a tendency to micromanage others. That's one of the ways in which they get in their own way. But these folks will deliver generally speaking, if you give them the latitude to do so. Now, on the, on, on the exact opposite side of the disk map, you know, these disks and so on the other side of the disk map, you have the steadiness styles. These folks really do prize receiving feedback. They want some validation. They want to have some assurance that they are doing it correctly because this particular style is very much so prone to imposter syndrome. But when you provide them with feedback, you need to present it in a particular way in order to be seen as approachable and to have that individual be receptive. The kind of feedback that I'm used to receiving, I, I can have very blunt, very straightforward feedback. I have no problem talking about the things that were wrong. I want those things brought to my attention without a lot of fuss so that I can fix them. Somebody with a steadiness style, on the other hand, need to be maybe a little bit more white glove with that individual. They tend to be very highly empathic. And so when they hear negative feedback, they do have a tendency to maybe take it a little bit more personally. Um, now, everybody has these kinds of different quirks with their personality. So being aware of those quirks ahead of time gives you the opportunity to stretch into their style and to become an adaptive leader. Those are the tools that discs get, that the DISC model and everything DISC give us, is the ability to not only understand ourselves, but to understand our coworkers on a much deeper level and to develop better, more flexible, more adaptable people skills for collaboration, for communication, for management, leadership, um, you know, 
we can even predict your conflict responses with a DISC assessment and train you on how to overcome some of the less helpful ones and replace those with ones that are much more collaborative and productive in the workplace. So there's a lot that DISC can do for an organization. Yeah, you got me interested. Uh, so tell me how you would implement this. So say you get a call from, let's say it's a three location dispensary. They already have maybe a manager, I don't know. Um, and they're saying, hey, Kevin, we're interested in having you implement this DISC thing. What, what, how are you going to do this? What does it look like? What are the steps? How do you know that you did it correctly? Yeah, so uh, step number one, uh, I need to talk with the folks that are in a decision-making position. And I want to also have a talk with the folks that are, you know, the stakeholders, the primary stakeholders in the management level. For a three-location um, dispensary, I, I, I would assume that what they're hoping for is to get a better collaborative or more productive, more harmonious work environment. The, the need might be a little vague and that's okay. That's why I have some discovery conversations. Now I, I you know, give those free, con I give those consultations for free because it helps me understand which of the programs I need to recommend. But let's say that for right now, the dispensary managers are seen as, as needing some additional support in terms of management training, because none of them have ever supervised people before. They were all talented bud tenders at the last dispo that they worked for, but they've never actually been responsible for leading a team of individuals. So there's a specific management training program for the um, everything disc suite that will help folks understand not only their innate inherent management style, but also where they can you know grow and to stretch into the styles of other folks. Now that, that's part of the solution. Remember, I'm an instructional systems designer, so I'm looking at the whole system. In order for the management training program to really work, it's helpful to have each person in the store go through what's called the workplace uh, assessment and soft skills training program. What that process looks like is you get a, a hyperlink in an email, you complete an assessment, it takes about 20 minutes to answer all the questions, and then you get access to a great online portal that helps you understand the results of your assessment in very easy, non-judgmental language. But what's great about this platform is when you group other people together, like group with a capital G, there's other features that activate that give an individual accessing their assessment results immediate and actionable strategies for relationship building, for communication, collaboration, um, you know, understanding what stresses uh, folks out. And they get that insight per individual on their team based on that other individual's DISC assessment. So imagine having almost like psychic superpowers and helping you understand your colleagues on a level that you've never had access to before. And now all of a sudden, you know how to approach that individual when they're having a bad day. You know what kinds of intangible incentives you can offer an individual. And also folks have a better understanding of like, hey, when this person's behaving like this and we don't really understand why it's a stress symptom it means something's wrong and it means that they need some support here are the ways in which you can offer support that they will be receptive to so that takes from a level of just supervision to actual management and not just management but management with a level of emotional intelligence that contributes to these things that are so vitally important, such as workplace culture, psychological safety needs. These are becoming more and more important in the business dialogue, but nobody is talking about the tools of helping you achieve them. And, and that's what Populous does, is we deliver that particular set of tools to help organizations achieve these seemingly vague notions of better mental health in the workplace, essentially. And one more question. I want to move on to the next topic here. Um, so, say you implement this whole uh, personality test with this system. How do you know that it's working? What are the, the the KPIs that you know that everything, all cylinders are firing? That you're just crushing it. High fives across the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, 
training metrics are a very interesting topic. It's a whole other conversation. But generally speaking, in a disk engagement like this, we, we do a couple of things. One, we'll try and do some sort of a, a pre-measure. Let's say that the goal is to improve management. Okay, well, what does improvement actually look like? We got to break that down a little bit because we can talk about store performance for a dispensary, but we know that store performance consists of things like inventory velocity, number of uh, repeat monthly customers, new customers per month, right? There's a whole series of numbers that we have to monitor because a, a dispensary is a multifaceted beast. Well, so are the team that manage that. So we want to understand and, and kind of come up with a way of measuring that. Uh, a a pre-survey is pretty typical, uh, but we can also just do this through qualitative assessment, right? Like checking in with folks, hearing what they're experiencing. And the, the great about the Everything Disc system is that there are opportunities to do that kind of listening because in addition to the classroom training experience that I you know offer with this, with the assessments, uh, I also encourage one-on-one -on -one coaching for key individuals, especially when it comes to making sure that they're implementing the action plan for relationship building or better collaboration, whatever it is, that they come up with at the end of the classroom experience. So there's lots of ways that we can you know, kind of keep tabs on the process through actively managing it. But if we're going to do a pre-measure, we also want to do that post-measure. So we take another version of the survey, ask about three to six months later, and then it's very easy to make a comparison between time one and time two. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the next topic I kind of wanted to talk about was, uh, we were touching about this a little earlier. Uh, we didn't use this exact term, but it was unconscious bias and stereotyping that comes along with hiring. Um, and so what are kind of the steps that companies, dispensaries can take to kind of get rid of this unconscious bias and stereotype when it comes to hiring? Well, number one, it's first examining all of your assumptions and, and make and just, you know, start from the assumption that you are making an assumption about everything, unless you have like concrete things outside your skull that you can point at and say, oh, this is why we're doing it this way. So start by questioning everything. Right? Aristotle said that the first step to wisdom is admitting that you know nothing. And that has not changed in the kind of two, three thousand odd years since he said it. So um, the other thing that you can do is take a look at how other organizations are dealing with this. Uh, I'm actually presenting on this topic at the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce um, on July 10th. And what I'm helping, what I'm starting that presentation with is showing a picture of somebody who could be a business professional, but they've got long dreadlocks. You know, a couple of white guys or a white woman and a white um, male with long dreadlocks, right? We see this kind of professional working in senior leadership positions at cannabis companies, but at a more you know traditional industry, like say insurance, that person might have a kind of glass ceiling that they're going to start bumping their head against simply because of their hairstyle. And so I wanted to ask everybody in the organization, hey, how many what assumptions are you making about an individual's ability to move up the corporate ladder based off of how their hair looks? And is that a fair judgment or a fair assessment? And so what I'm, I'm highlighting is that we, we tend to fixate on these very superficial demographic variables that we can easily identify about folks. And we've been brought up to believe that our way of interpreting those variables is accurate and helps us make snap judgments about individuals that are accurate and fair. And quite frankly, they are not. And I'll give you a good example. Let's go back to the example of the, the two marketing professionals, the one that came in with a white collar um, background in higher education, the one who came up through the ranks. Now, both let's say that both of these folks have the influencer style. Um, of personality. The one that uh, has the higher education, when those influencer styles become very stressed out and, and are in incredibly information dense environments, um, detail tends to stress them out. And they tend to gloss over things. They have some weird subconscious behaviors where they kind of shunt that work off to the side, focus on the stuff that's more Import, um, more rewarding for them. And so they kind of develop some odd procrastination behaviors. But that particular quirk might be viewed differently based on the individual that's sitting in front of you. One of the other quirks is that, uh, you know, folks in that, with that style, when they become very stressed out, their speech becomes very almost erratic. 
right? And I don't mean to say they start speaking the word salad, but they tend to jump from idea to idea. They often are more enthusiastic than the rest of the room might be about a particular idea. Um, they, the energy seems to be a little frenetic from them at times. Now, if an individual with a higher ed background starts demonstrating that behavior, other folks with a higher ed background might be willing to give that individual a little bit more grace and be like, there's something going on here. What the, what the heck's going on? But the individual that came up through the ranks, if they start doing that, they might just be assumed to not be as professional because, well, they haven't had that university experience that the rest of us have had. So, like, this is just an example of why we need to hire for folks who are more like us, who make us feel comfortable, where we aren't challenged as individuals. And that's the other part of unconscious bias is, quite frankly, when you see it happening, you're usually pandering to the comfort zones of people in positions of power. And so that's the last thing that I need to advise folks on is if you want to create more inclusive environments and overcome that style bias, you have to recognize that those comfort zones are traps and that you need to get out of them. And if somebody is challenging you in a certain way, you need to stop before you jump to conclusions about why they're doing what they're doing. And that can be hard. It can be really hard. It requires training. And that's what everything DISC does is it gives people the training to help them stop in the moment and say, okay, this is what I would have thought, but now with what I know about how personalities work and how people work, how am I going to judge this individual more fairly and look at the situation through a more critical business lens? Yeah, very, very thoughtful answer. Uh, my follow-up question, you're kind of already starting to touch upon this, is how does Kevin Taylor, how does Populous, how does the DISC assessment, all your various tools, tricks of the trade, how do you help? companies reduce bias, promote diversity, equity, inclusion in the Canvas industry? Well, the first step would honestly be helping them understand that these personality styles have very specific patterns of behavior. And these are durable patterns of behavior. The, the research behind DISC shows that it is durable across gender, across different racial groups, across levels of education, and it's been translated into dozens of languages. So it's durable across even the linguistic barrier. There's something very fundamentally, fundamentally hardwired that the DISC model taps into. So once you understand the patterns of behavior that go along with this, and you understand that it does not matter what your background is, what your skin tone is, that when you see this pattern of behavior, the superficial aspects of it, that's just seasoning on the dish. It isn't the main ingredient. But a carrot is a carrot, whether you are making steamed carrots or carrot chips, right? And that's the key thing to remember here is when you are starting to attack that unconscious bias, you have to have something else to replace it with because that bias is an attempt to make sense of the world. And I don't ever want to take something away from somebody without giving them something better to replace it with. And that's a key thing that Populous does is once we break this down, we don't belabor the point the way that a lot of diversity and inclusion training does. Because a lot of the times those workshops end with, and as far as what you can do about it, just try harder. That's not helpful. That is not helpful. People need something to do differently if they're going to try harder. And so teaching folks with, you know, giving people the people reading skills, helping them with job aids and desk references, providing the coaching, there's a way of implementing and integrating this into an organization. And one of the skills of a, a certified facilitator such as myself is that we're used to working with folks and encouraging this and to coaching them to a higher level of performance, which is ultimately what we're doing here. Awesome. This is really great stuff. This is Kevin Taylor. He has a company called Populous. Just a few more fun questions for you, Kevin, if you're comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell me about the first time you used cannabis? So, 16 years old. Um, I'm hanging out with one of my best friends in high school. Um, and honestly, I, I was coming out of kind of a dark period. That's not uncommon. Teenage years are, are not great uh, for a lot of folks. For me, in the community I grew up in, they were particularly stressful. Um, and uh, I'd been a really bad place psychologically for a long time. And then, you know, I sat down and smoked a joint with my best friend and his older sister. And I laughed my head off. Oh, my God. I got the giggles so hard and his older sister was such a comedian and just was telling joke after joke and I could not remember the last time I laughed that hard 
And it was a game changer for me. Um, you know, it was a lot of us do when we're teenagers, we started self-medicating for reasons. And at the time I didn't recognize what I was doing, but yeah, cannabis, uh, probably saved my life in a lot of ways that early on in life. It, it gave me a lot of things that I needed at that point in time. And it's been a you know, regular part of my life ever since. And now as a grown up, right, it's just, you know, at the age 42, right, I've got a wide variety of joints and, and old sports injuries. And so cannabis has you know, saved my life again by giving me an alternative using opioids. And we know how that path ends for a lot of people. Yeah, right, with, right there with you, brother, man. Uh, can, you, can you tell me about your favorite cannabis product? Oh, I like them all. Um, it really depends. Edible, that's kind of what I was leading at. Oh, uh, yeah, so for like, for edibles, I, I'm in the high tolerance love, so I love me a 50 milligram uh, gummy that's like 50 milligrams of THC, 50 milligrams of CBD. I mean, that's my jam. Love those. Uh, as far as concentrates and flour go, I really love fruity, sour strains. So things kind of in the hybrid territory, really rich in mirrors scene, have that super skunky factor to them that gives it a nice kind of hazy experience. Those are those are definitely my jam. Yeah. Last question: uh, What does your crystal ball say is going to happen in the next five to ten years in the cannabis industry? Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. If I'm, Nobody knows. That yeah. <laughs> one of the things I'm, I'm hoping, like everybody in this street, I, I really want rescheduling and federal reform to happen. That will change so many things. Um, I think you are going to start seeing more business to business services offering value once cannabis companies can tap into them and they have the revenue to do that. Uh, I think you're also going to see a lot of consolidation. I think you're going to see a lot of turnover in ownership. Um, once you see federal reform. And I don't know how many other people are talking about this, but I also think that you're going to see a very, an explosion of national brands once we're allowed to do interstate commerce, but specifically in cultivation. I think you're going to see a consolidation and a shrinking of the number of retail brands out there. Um, and you'll end up with specialty experiences in that regard. But every single cannabis company right now that's vertically integrated is over-invested in cultivation centers. Michigan, Oklahoma, Oregon, Washington, they are going to dump so much fabulous weed on the market once we have interstate commerce that all of those other cultivation centers in, in, in other states, they're going to go up for sale very quickly to get them off the balance sheet. Yeah, I, I like this prediction. This is actually pretty logical. Uh, this is Kevin Taylor. Um, he's from Populous. Um, he'll help you get the best employees. Do you have a last minute pitch you want for the audience, Kevin? Yeah. Um, just the one thing that I love about about um, the everything disk system, I'm very picky. I, I chose it because it's an implement for a client. Uh, it's accessible. It is simple without being simplistic. It is research-backed. It is vetted. And it's got a 200-page science manual with all of the statistics on why this is a valid assessment. It's been adopted by thousands of organizations. It's been researched extensively across millions of assessments over the past uh, several decades, going back to the 1970s. And it's such a powerful system that you know can very easily create a lot of value and, and really start not just create, not just kind of removing sources of workplace toxicity, but replacing that with something that's so much more rewarding. Awesome. Well, this is Kevin Taylor again from Populous. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, this has been, this worked out really well. I think you gave a lot of. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate you. Um, definitely wish you the best.